First, I want to apologize for my voice. It's a little rough. I was in uh, Phoenix yesterday watching a football game, so it'll be cracking on and off. Go Rams. Where's Ken? Ken? Anyway. Am I scared or nervous about doing the job? Yes, terrified. But the reality, and the good fortunate thing is, only when I get a chance to think about it. I'm not given much opportunity to think about it. We're starting to get to the point where we have a lot of stuff done, um, and it, it's going to be cool to start showing it to everybody. For the most part in the project, I'm, you know, kind of an information person, going to different par departments and like a sponge, soak up as much information as I can so I can direct people in the proper way. It's very, very challenging. At times it can be incredibly stressful, like right now. <laughs> Let's get back to it. It's Rita calling from Sony. In terms of our new leads in the departments, and they're rising from a senior level uh, environment artist to an art director, from an art director to a producer, from a lead animator to a game director. It's really a testament to the level of, of skill that each individual brings, that they have that multifaceted background, or at least the drive to pursue something and pursue it at 110%. So you can't jump onto the chain until you activate it. The way a game director works at Sony, you gotta have your hands in everything. Maybe much to the dismay of some of the other people, you're the quality control, you're the check to make sure that everything stays within the realm, the, the mythos that we've created with God of War. I'm in meetings right from when I get in, probably till about seven or eight, sometimes later than that at night, and then I actually have other work that I have to get done instead of just sitting around talking like a gas bag. So it sounds like I'm bitching about it, but you know what? It's, it's not, I, I'm totally into it. I love it. But it's definitely bigger than I had ever imagined. One of the biggest new elements I've had to mentally deal with is the idea that as a producer, you're essentially everyone's boss, so you do wield a considerable amount of quote-unquote power. From the creative side of things, it's probably the one thing I have to constantly put a check on. From where I came from, I was way more involved in the creative. That's nice. As a producer, every time I make a comment on the creative, I have to make sure that I'm cautioning it with the idea of, hey, look, this is one creative mind coming to you with an opinion. This scene is so fucked up, it doesn't, I mean, it's like, <laughs> where do you start? There's a lot to be learned about just interacting with people and keeping my cool as much as I can um, and you know not trying to offend people like on the last project and up until I started as an art director I was very blunt and kind of sometimes it might have had kind of like you know a fuck it at attitude but um, now I have to be a lot more political about things and, I, and it's actually like the more I do it the more I understand it the more I enjoy it. Something that we decided when we originally started the Santa Monica studio was to go for a very open plan uh, office so that everyone sits in an enormous room, there are very low dividers between different people's desks. We try and keep people sitting next to the people that they are directly working with. So, you know, the combat guys have most to do with the animators, so they sit next to the animators. The production sat slap bang in the middle of the floor, they basically can see everyone moving around, everyone is near to the production department. The programmers are all sitting next to each other and we sit near to the technical artists because uh, they're, they're people we spend an enormous amount of time communicating with. So, you know, the entire structure of the studio really aims at fostering easy communication that doesn't rely on email and doesn't rely on uh, chance encounters in the hallway. It's very important that you make people talk to each other and this seems to be a very good way of doing it. Upon my initial observation, it was like, holy cow, you know, everybody is there and my desk in particular is right on the kind of the main thoroughfare like I-5 running down the middle of sunny Santa Monica. So, you know, I hear everybody walk by, I hear everybody's conversations. I prefer it just because, you know, I can give Steve shit or I can give Todd Pabby shit on my left or whatever. I mean, for that, it's, it's kind of a nice break than just locking yourself in your office. First coming here, I liked everything about the place except for that aspect of it. Is sitting in a big, basically like a gymnasium with a bunch of desks in it, and like you could hear like half of what people are talking about all over the place, and it might be kind of hard to get focused. But it really does bring out that collaborative experience. It's in your face. You see what everybody else is doing, so you end up understanding inherently from working here and walking, you know, to go get a soda or something like that. You you get an understanding subliminally of what's going on in the game. When we want to get something in the game as simple as Kratos, the main character, goes up to a giant column in the world, 
and grabs it, and then when the player rapidly presses the circle button, he's going to be able to go, like pull on it, and then successfully pull the column down while the column breaks and shatters. There's enemies on top of it that end up falling and dying. Just that one sequence alone, you have to involve the level guys, because they basically have to create the space in which it takes place in. Those level guys will also be modeling the column. Animation has to wait until that column gets designed. Then effects have to get put on it. Then a designer has to put it in and attach it to the buttons. And then a sound person has to come in and attach the sounds on top of that. If any special code has to get done, meaning a tool needs to get written in order to get this to happen, code has to be notified early on. Almost every single department has their hands on this thing, and this is a thing that could, you know, basically take up a minute of gameplay. <laughs> God of War 2 has about 70 people on it. We got a pretty big team. Each department within the game development process has their own lead. And each week we have leads meetings kind of discussing specifics of what's going on. I will uh, jump right in with uh, Charlie's updates. Great, okay. Um... This title, Visual Development Director, is really kind of something that we wanted to test out because we really didn't have anything like this in, in our production pipeline. I really wanted to get all the visual development guys together because before, there wasn't a lot of collaboration. <laughs> we represent the whole minority group here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is actually what it's like. <laughs> I want to get an update on what you guys have been working on this week. Okay. Um, if you guys have been working this week. Um, so. <laughs> Um, why don't we start on this side? Eric, you okay. want to just kind of run through some of the stuff that you've been uh, working on? All right. Uh, this is the, uh, the great Titan Oceanus concept that mm. we've been working on. It's about camaraderie, I think, you know, with the people that I work with. They constantly push me, and hopefully I push them. How big is this guy right now? He's apparently? huge. He's, he's massive. It's just kind of about really enjoying yourself and really uh, unleashing stuff in your mind to create something better than what we did before on God of War 1. It would be so cool if we can actually fly through all this stuff. Oh yeah, it would I think we, they were talking about that. I don't know if it's going to happen. It would be cool. I've been working on uh, IO cool. horses. I'm definitely excited that uh, I get to be part of, you know, a team that gets to create this, you know, world that people are going to see. It's just another take on Greek mythology. So it's really cool. Cool. Oh, let's get back to work. To be able to form a team that we can really feel comfortable to, you know, to say anything, whether it's, you know, critiquing each other's work or just wanting to hang around with each other, that part of it I'm probably most proud of on this time around. We switched gears and we started doing something completely different at the drop of a hat. And that happens all the time. My job is primarily managing the production side, the art, the content that actually goes into the game. And Charlie works to develop the content that we end up creating on paper first. The art group is comprised uh, a number of different teams. There's the animators, there's cinematic animators, tech artists who basically do everything from create rigs for characters to create scripts to help environment artists model faster. Then we have environment artists and we have character artists and we have effects artists. It's going to be tweakable. Okay. Well, the programmers are implementing features and uh, making tools for the artists uh, and the designers, for that matter, to use. We don't uh, write the game for them. We write the, uh, the tools which they use to make the game themselves. And um, we've had enormously good results from doing this. We find that the, the artists are much better positioned to, to use all this cool stuff than the than programmers are. And, and that's, that's great, that's by design, but... My job here entails managing the level design team, uh, making sure they're on task and on track. Level design is a lot about coming up with the puzzles and the layout and the pacing of an area and coming up with the themes and how they integrate with the story. Yeah. A really good puzzle is you come in, you know your objective, but you're not really quite sure how to reach that goal or objective. And it's kind of the process of going through and, and figuring out and having that ah, aha moment, you know, like, oh, I get it. And then you're able to like go ahead and solve it. And as lo long as it's not too like hard, not too easy, it's finding that sweet spot. Okay. You can trigger a camera 
from the, the lever that would transition, and then when you when you successfully completed the lever, it'll be already transitioned, so it won't be like a big right. uh, cut. All right. The challenge for the designers is we really have to focus on making it fun. I mean, a lot of ideas are good in theory, and they sound like they can be really cool, but taking it from a concept and a, and a, and a thought and an idea to actually making it work and playing it are such different things. Our job is to really nail, hey, is this fun? Is it challenging for the player? Well, Everything. I thought you were only focusing on animation. No. Well, Whole yes. Whole I'd say that the sound needs a total rework because the sounds of it crashing through, it's none of it sounds impressive. I want DTS 6.1. The best laid plans, you know, it is exactly the best phrase for it because doesn't matter how well we plan something out, doesn't matter how solid we think something is, when you get in there and you see it in three dimensions and you play it, you're like, wow. In my head and on paper, it felt different. We have to fix this, you know, we have to change this. We'll magnify that by a thousand because it's every single aspect has the exact same result. Each department, you know, art, animation, um, characters, visual development, programming, and design, that was pretty sweet. Only the best here at Sony Computer Entertainment America. We hold things together with really important tape. One of the areas that I'm most pleased with and surprised about is the fact that there are a lot of people that really banded around Corey and supported him through this endeavor. He's in a pressure situation, and without the team, he's left with nothing. I gotta say, it's way better than it was before. But uh, what I would like to think my reputation is, is, hey, this guy is very passionate and is constantly all about the game, like works tirelessly to find solutions in every possible aspect and whatever is needed, I do to get the job done. What really most likely goes on is, meh, he's okay. He's a little bit easier to work with than Dave, but you know, he still changes his mind all the time uh, and can't make up his mind about what he wants if only he could choose what he wanted. But uh, Overall, he's, he's, he's pretty cool, you know? That's probably what it is, mixed in with, I think he's a dick. I let them win this time to give them a full sense of security. Corey's generally a pretty good guy to work with. Um, there's been a few times, particularly towards the end of this project, where you could swear he's channeling Dave Jaffe sometimes. You know, he can be a very uh, stubborn uh, individual, but uh, generally he's a pretty nice chap. You know, we'll be sitting in a meeting and Corey will say something like, you know, what? Whatever happened to the Golden Fleece or something like that? It's like, what? what? You know, everybody's like wondering what's going on with the Golden Fleece, and that becomes the the new priority. And the priority isn't the Colossus anymore; it's the Golden Fleece. Well, the Colossus is, is a lot more important. The priorities change just like that on a dime, so it kind of changes the dimension of the team a little bit very quickly. Corey's a handful, um, but and yes, he Corey can be flippant, but it's all in, it, it's all well-meaning. I mean. Corey has a great vision, is making a great game. We're all here to support that vision. Um, and you're going to have to change your mind a lot. You're going to have to keep pushing the edge. If something doesn't work that sounded great originally, you're going to have to change it. You might have to change that thing 15 times. And I think that's why people can get frustrated with anybody in a creative uh, position, especially one that is, is in a director position. I mean. Everybody bitches about Stanley Kubrick, but he went out and made the finest films ever. Like, when is that on? It's on PBS. Yeah, it's like on PBS. PBS? Yeah. Who watches fucking PBS? PBS? I thought people just pretended to watch Rather PBS. Like, I watch the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, and that's, PBS. That's, that's, that's really what I watch. Bad. But that's totally not true. You know that they watch like USA and like, every Lorenzo Lamas movie. We are experiencing some technical difficulties, so we're, we're doing a redo and starting over. Nice. I'm ready. So we this is going to start in odd turn 10. That's very pretty. Hello? But, uh, Does your wife do your ringtones for you or what? All right, start taping now. Got we it. had a little, a little glitch in the Cyclops mini game, so we had to start over. And I blame Joel Tobble for that. That's him right there, ladies and gentlemen. The talent level of the team, just the amount of guys here that are able to, to produce art and animations and think of, think of different crazy ideas to do with Kratos and the programmers, the, the talent level on the team has just been absolutely astonishing. Although challenging and not easy and not perfect, 
I think the teamwork that's been going on for the past couple of years is something this whole studio should be proud of. I've never met a group of people who are more enthusiastic and passionate about what they do. Nobody really has an attitude or um, that's misplaced or anything like that. Everybody has this healthy level competition and um, you know you look over your shoulder to see what somebody else is doing because maybe they can you can learn something from them. When you see other environment artists and you go over at lunch or on a break and you check out what they're building and you take off ideas from them and they bounce off ideas with you and everyone's giving feedback. It keeps a little bit of healthy competition going and at the same time it brings up the quality of the game. This is a team that I think truly inspires each other. You have to be on all the time and if you're off people notice and the work suffers. So, you know, you generally need to come in and have five good days, not a single bad day. Of course, that's not possible because we're human beings. E3 is a big opportunity for media to get a glimpse into what's going on with the various software as well as hardware. It's kind of an opportunity for developers to kind of show off. It's bigger than Oscar night. I mean, it's huge. It's a chance where you, you get all these you get all developers, you get all studios, you get all the, the gaming consoles like PlayStation, Xbox, everyone's going to be there. It's, it's hyped up, everyone's psyched up, There's, everyone's just a fan of games. We are about to go into our E3 meeting, sort of a pre-E3 update meeting to kind of get a status check from all the key leads uh, of where we're at on the entire game. And this is actually going to be my first playthrough of the E3 build all put together. And hope everything goes fantastic because we don't have that much time. After I hit yes or no on the progressive scan, what's the next image that comes up? Front end. Making demos for E3, it's, it's kind of one of those necessary evils. And it's something that we decided we would embrace when we were working on God of War. We decided, you know, man, it sucks doing this, but, you know, let's just make the best of it because, you know, if we're ever going to make this game successful, then, uh, you know, making the press uh, notice it at E3 uh, would be very important. We start, Corey, start <coughs> first. So this begins this where? This is the beginning, right there. E3 is important to God of War 2 because this is our opportunity to get the franchise out. We're kind of taking the training wheels off here and giving other people the controller and saying, you know, you play it the way you want to play it. We're going to have to gauge the reaction from that. What? Why did that guy just disappear? Is this not working? I didn't do anything. I don't know if this is all the latest stuff, because I'm seeing older animations. That has to get worked out. What about the art on this area? I thought it was... It's done. Yeah. Right? Those little landing pads are missing. Uh, Did we, like, check this stuff before we have a meeting like this? Uh, it would be more we were, effective. We were doing our best to do that. I'm not saying you're not doing your best, I'm just saying, like, would it be more advantageous? There feels like a lot of stuff like we, this. We would. We wouldn't be having this discussion until 7 o'clock tonight. If that's what it's going to be, then it's what it's going to be, right? Um, no. So, I don't know, maybe if there's a lighting thing to do to kind of call attention to it a little bit more. I really want people to walk away from this going, fuck. I really didn't think that they could make a game better than the first one. We're just going to trigger the Medusa to fucking jump you at this point. <laughs> right out at you. like. She's big enough that she essentially almost fills the, the front screen and she just, ah, right there and attacks you. Could she pop out? Well, uh, could you, hold on. Could from she... this angle, I don't want to swap angles. It'd probably be much lower to be more dramatic, but I want to stay in the hallway. I don't want to pop to other angles. I know, I understand. Player's here, she jumps out, scares him, knocks him, boom, and the camera keeps tracking towards the Medusa, so you get close up into her face and, and then cut. That's a CS move. Can you do that? It's not a trivial matter. It's, it's no longer a simple. It's, no, it's a non-trivial matter. <laughs> it, was, it was a simple setup before, and it won't be quickly back. Right. It's really easy to go through a production and go, you know, OK, this is sort of working all the way. I'll get the last 10% you know, when we start heading down. The problem with that kind of mentality is always that 10% turns into 50 60 70%, because it's like, oh, well, what I thought was going to work didn't. Now I'm back to the drawing board. E3 allows us that opportunity to just go, we're going to get it all done, and it's got to be done all the way. And it kind of is a little wake-up call for a lot of people. I think that's great. Well, Pegasus animations, just so the Pegasus himself feel like we're still in first pass with not a lot of stuff in there, and I thought we were going to be much further along. This is the new God of War 2. This is going to be our signature piece. Steve is the guy that has to basically jump in the middle of the firefight, 
and calmly figure out how it's all going to get figured out. Bullets whizzing by all over the place, and he's got to figure out what's going to go on here. And, you know, I'm over there with, like, a Gatlin gun just firing bullets all over the place, throwing grenades at him. You know, hey, we should change this. Let's put this over here. What if we had rain in this scene? This would be awesome. But just going up in his head, schedule's ballooning out of control, and I'm just, you know, like a kid who's found his dad's gun firing it all over the place. He's not sitting around waiting for this problem to get solved on his own. There's a lot of animation work to be done. For whatever it's worth, it seemed like we've been talking a lot about like art and, and some animation stuff, but it seems like when you go through the level, there's no enemies in there. It's this, uh, there's, there's a no lot chefs. of design work there's, that has to go through. Pegasus is like almost like completely undesigned at this point. I, I just, um, I totally disagree with that statement. You guys need to sit down <laughs> and play Pegasus. Like, I play it every day at Ray's desk. I mean, it's not, right. it doesn't feel like... I, I'm, not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to start shit or anything. I'm just saying, like, we've been talking a lot about the art. I just well, felt like the artists are here, and from a Pegasus standpoint, I had said, I need to sit down with Chip and Aaron. The purpose of this meeting is just to talk about the things that we can do, and that's then, then I basically have no place in saying that, I guess. Six coming from a really good place, man. He's a guy that I feel truly leads by example. You know, this guy shows you that it can be done by doing it himself, by really instilling that sense of pride within your own work, by showing that he has that sense of pride in the work. I'm not trying to start shit like it's not just observation. Yes, you are, but it's a good shit that you're starting. This isn't a dig on you, so don't think I'm attacking you. But you like fucking suck. <laughs> no, but seriously, we do have to, we gotta fucking step it up. That's it. Excellent. There are numerous red flags. There's a ton of stuff that really needs a lot of work. Stitching the level together still really isn't there. It's kind of duct taped together. Not even duct, it's scotch tape. It's scotch tape together right now. It's not even that much. Uh, we've got a lot of art issues, a ton of animations that have to get done. So we're going to have a lot of fun trying to figure that one out. It was a good thing to kind of get a status check from everybody, but uh, we have a shitload of work to do. It was also mentioned that the projectiles that fire from Pegasus seem to be coming from the Pegasus's ass. Pegasus is kind of an interesting situation that we got into because it's kind of like developing a new game. Every step of the way, you know, you get one thing fixed and then you find something else that you didn't know about. So it's, it's not like you can set it, say it was broken, but it's a new feature that you need and it's still happening right now. Pegasus is a different game. Might as well be called Pegasus. It doesn't look like this year we are making it with Pegasus, and it sucks for all of us, but we all kind of feel the exact same way, which is we don't want anybody to see it until we all feel 100% about it. So that's the sort of the double-edged sword of E3. Is, you know, you can chase the demo, trying to get it out there, trying to show people what you got, but if it's crap, you're gonna pay the price. I was running the Pegasus push to E3, and to see that not make it was like getting kicked in the balls by a donkey very hard. I think in the end we'll be all right, but I think right now there's still a lot to figure out with Pegasus. Just fix those weapons. Right now you can tell everybody's stressed out, so you don't want to talk to anybody. Um, you just kind of, if you stick around our little Viz Dev area, it'll be safe. So we're pretty relaxed. Hopefully this will only be seen after the game comes out. So. We have to kind of get everything out before everybody builds it, so we've had our share. So now it's their turn. Can't go home until he goes home. I'm sleeping here tonight, man. There's no hope for you. It's all over. There you have it. I'm sleeping here tonight. And that hole that is created, it feels like if we made it more extreme, like the actual crack cracks right here on one frame. We got so much done in this last month. We lost a few years off of our life due to sleep deprivation, but you know, we got a lot done. They get to a point where they're just like, I don't know, should I attack? I don't know. Over here, they just, they just want to love. So yeah, I don't, I don't have any idea why he's just decided now that attacking is not in his best interest. It's incredibly daunting knowing that the entire team is pushing themselves really hard and everybody's, you know, staying late, putting in lots of overtime and really putting everything they have into this demo. It's a much more 
tense environment than it normally is. I mean, everyone's really under the gun. A lot of pressure, a lot of tired people. It's not rocket science. No one dies as a result of doing it, but it's a pretty stressful uh, job nonetheless. Lots of very passionate people working on the project, and that can lead to some, uh, some arguments and, uh, and stress. And there's definitely a few evenings you go home and you just want to go and punch something. The stress level gets high enough that I just try to mentally just stop myself from caring and just ro sort of robotically go about it. And no matter what somebody says to me, it's just like, okay, they don't mean that. I'm just going to keep moving. There's a lot of freaking out and then just kind of stepping back and just reminding yourself that, you know, <laughs> it's a video game. Who controls the camera tween? Does anybody? Is it automatic? How's that work? The product is ours. We have the right to beat the living crap out of it. We have the right to be picky and, and brutal and evaluate it from the, you know, this is shit, this is the worst I've ever seen. I mean, we have the right, we're creating that, we have the right to say that. And I find that if we don't take that approach, or if someone doesn't take that approach, when we release the product, everyone else in the world will. There's a smoothness to where the animation needs to be, and it's not there. It's not about you're not doing your job, it's about the product isn't where it needs to be, what do we need to do to get the product there? That's always been my philosophy. I gotta say, the ending is low budget. It's truly a live or die situation, you know. I want to make a great game and I want to make a great experience, but if I don't, it's probably it for me. <laughs> I hope not, but most likely it is. I drove around for an hour looking for a parking space. I had forgotten how fantastic E3 is. Fuck that. It's been a long road and we only have a small amount of the game finished. But it's showing very well. Right now the booth is pretty packed. We've only got eight stations, so a lot of people are at the booth. It's very exciting, very good for us. I'm looking forward to seeing people's responses back to this thing. Right now I haven't heard anything, but seeing the crowds is definitely an inspiring thing. But it's cool, it's uh, so surreal like seeing the game you work on, like on the floor, it's awesome. Fantastic. Uh, I like the same gameplay with uh, more intense moves. I, I like that you can do multiple grabs and uh, that even though the guy is technically dead, you can still beat the crap out of him. As a consumer, I say, why am I going to go draw cash on a 360 or a PS3 when I can get that kind of performance out of my PS2 and a game that looks that great? That's awesome. I was actually kind of bummed out when I heard we were going to do this game on the PlayStation 2. You know, going to E3, I was just like, this is great. We're squeezing juice out of the PS2 that's, you know, looking at the games of E3. 99% of the time when I look at a game, I'm like, our game looks better. The day we ship our Gold Master, that will be the end of the PS2 uh, era for me. And I'm going to be very sad. It's been, without doubt, the most fun console I've ever worked on. It's been a very, very good few years working on this machine. And I really feel like we're giving it a good send-off. I think at E3 to see even with the PS3 booth 15 feet away, we still had lines of people wanting to play the game and people really enthusiastic and talking about it. It's why we make the games. It's why we, we suffer. Uh, and that's why we enjoy ourselves, is because we want people to have fun playing it and to see people having fun playing it. That's, that's what it's all about. Jared! <laughs> What's up, boss? How you doing, man? Dude, this is the first like game I'm really actually proud of. I'm 31 years old and I still can't believe I made games, right? I mean, that's just, that's a trip. That really is kind of worth it. But um, yeah, it's incredibly rewarding to see people that actually are feeling something when they play this game. I'm like, this is the most excited I've ever been in my life. Dude, I'm totally geeked up. I show up yesterday, I'm like, whee, you know, all happy. Nuts. This is great. Between hyped up, exhausted, relieved, stressed, I'm all over the map right now. It's been, a, it's been a pretty crazy day. I think the interest in the game is really high right now, and that's awesome. I think it's, you know, it's really encouraging to see, and I hope that we can build and maintain this level of media hype. I think it all speaks well to this game coming out of the door next year and just rocking. <laughs>
that's taking up the proper amount of memory space on the disk implemented in the way that it's supposed to be implemented. Though it may not be fun, though it may not be perfectly, perfectly, the emphasis on the syllable was wrong, uh, perfectly um, implemented and it may not be, you know, have the final look of the entire thing, but the elements have to be there. Okay. Good to go. Sweet. Thank you. Solid. 15 days until alpha. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, basically, this is the big push. This is it. Basically, we're in the mode right now where there's the final things that we're putting together to put together the game. These guys are working their asses off, and I'm thinking about how to reward them. We have to do something. We have to get together and really have an opportunity as a team to toast each other, toast the progress thus far and, you know, what we've been able to achieve in such a short amount of time and with the stresses and the strains. These are the most talented people I've ever been privileged to work alongside, and that's the honest to God's truth. I feel great. We have done a lot. I know that at the Halloween party last year, we still had a lot of work ahead of us and there was a lot of uncertainty. What we've accomplished in this period of time is just amazing. There's definitely a few things in this game. There's been a couple of things I've seen in, in the last few weeks. It's like, God damn, that's pretty fucking cool. It's gonna be pretty good. This is a very important time for our studio. If we can come out and make God of War 2 better than the first one, we'll be recognize the industry over as a powerhouse. It's all about doing what we can to achieve perfection. And I think we know we'll never hit it 100% but the mantra that's never talked about, but the general force of the leadership here within the studio is, let's always strive for it. I'm out to make the best game possible. The amount of time and effort and energy and life that I've put into these things, I don't get it back, so you might as well do it right. It's really for the fans of this game, and the more people that play it, the better that we feel that we've really reached out to a lot of people, taken these people on an adventure, told them a story. So is that good? That's good. Have we got it all? We got it all. Fan-fucking-tastic. I mean, it's, it seems to be taking a bit more of an important role lately. Like a lot of people. <laughs> Game is actually turning the pickups to more of an in-game acquisition. So every time you fight a Cyclops and you rip his eye out, you're actually going to be able to collect that and use that to get rewards. 
Help me with these beasts. I have found the secret of Medusa's temple. This is really showing that idea that Kratos isn't the only one on the island seeking out the Sisters of Faith. There are many heroes throughout mythology that are actually trying to change their own fate. And the enemies that we're bringing back are not just going to be sort of the standard size. We're actually going to be bringing back some of the other larger sized enemies. Now we're all the way back to where we started, and I'm actually able to use the Golden Fleece to throw the Medusa's beam back and turn the door to stone. And that is our little sneak peek into the E3 demo. I want to thank you guys for checking it out. To me, it's from the, from the gut, you know, from the heart, that, yeah, it's going to measure up. I worked on the first game. Half these people worked on the first game, you know? Uh, what the first game was was a culmination of all these people's work. And this is our blood, sweat, and tears, man. We would never, ever let it fall below what we strove for. We are absolutely not resting until we eclipse the quality of the first games. The response we wanted was what we got out of that press event. Because going into it, I kind of was like, what is the point of this, you know? E3's in two and a half, three weeks. Let's just show it E3, you know? But it was good. I see the purpose of it. That's really what game development is. They just keep moving the goal line, you know? Taking the ball away when you're trying to kick it. That's, that's generally the, the uh, status quo for this job. How you doing? I'm Corey Barlog, director of God of War 2, and what I'm going to do is give you a little tutorial on how to use the mechanics of the game. First thing we're going to show you is the rapidly pressing circle button mechanic. The circle button prompt will come up in the left-hand corner of the screen. You just rapidly press a circle button until you complete the action. Cranks, somewhat misunderstood mechanics sometimes. There's an icon in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. You don't actually have to follow the icon animation, you just follow Kratos' progress on the crank circle. Just make gentle circles following his progress all the way around. The new feature in God of War 2, the grapple, has little icons throughout the world that glow, just like that. And when you approach them, they will radiate, letting you know that you're in range. This means that you can now hit the R1 button, Kratos will throw his blade out, you'll attach to the grapple. If you press the button down and hold it, you'll actually continue your swing. As long as you keep holding it, you'll keep swinging. When you press the X button, you'll release and you'll be able to continue on to either the next grapple or where you need to go. Another mechanic that we have from the last game is the stick shake mechanic. So when you get frozen by a Medusa or get hit by one of the Griffins, the stick shake icon will appear in the left-hand corner of the screen. And essentially, you take the left analog stick and shake it back and forth rapidly until you either shake out or die. The circle button appearing above the creatures basically indicates that you can go and grab the character and enter a CS minigame. These are the stick swoop icons, one of the tougher minigames. All you need to do is just follow the prompt on the screen with the left analog stick and make circles in the shape that the icon is there. It's pretty simple, but very difficult sometimes. A new mechanic that we have in God of War 2 is kind of a fishing reel type mechanic. You're going to throw your blades into characters, and then you make circles with the left analog stick as if you're reeling them in. These are the multi-button CS minigames. So you initiate the minigame, and then follow the button prompts that come on the screen, hitting the X, hitting the circle, hitting the circle again, until the character's dead. Another new mechanic we have in God of War 2 is the L1-R1. Essentially, you are alternating from L1 to R1 as if you're shaking something back and forth. These are the Amulet of the Fates statues. When you are not in range, they, you can't activate the Amulet of the Fates, hitting L1 and pressing R1. But when you go into range, they'll radiate with a circle. And then if you press L1 and then R1, you'll activate the Amulet of the Fates, which slows down the world time. 
Rage of the Titans, activated just like Rage of the Gods in God of War 1. You press the L3 and R3 command, the two analog sticks, press them in. The unique thing about this game is you're able to turn it on and turn it off. And that's it. That is the little tutorial walkthrough for the God of War 2 mechanics. The description for Kratos was just, we want him to be badass. And that was the direct quote from Dave, you know, that, that he used the word that a lot all over. Um, so I knew that that, okay, that's a definite, we need to get that. But at the beginning, we didn't even know if it was going to be male, female. Some of the sketches were actually a, a female Kratos, possibly. We're looking for anything that might work. This was just, it doesn't really look like much in <laughs> some kind of alien creature. <laughs> or a little bit more comical, big hands, big feet, a flame for his hair. It's almost like holding the weapon like a cool cue. Originally, I was feeling like maybe we need to kind of give him a little soft spot, you know, something that humanizes him. And so that was, we tried the whole baby idea, kind of like the lone wolf and cub, and figured, okay, we can't do a baby because <laughs> we can't have a baby getting injured or anything like that. So, okay, how about... Um, I put a puppy back there, and Dave actually liked that idea at first, but just in terms of implementing it, it would cause a lot more gameplay issues. Eventually, Dave kind of went a different direction with it, <laughs> and it's like, hey, how about you have to kill the puppy before it turns into a service? I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> the second stage is we went through a lot of different types of characters. Dave saw this one, he's like, oh yeah, it's capturing the feeling of what he wanted. The next big challenge was, what is he gonna be using? You know, because I mean, uh, this is a game, and one of the big things that um, we need to really push is, how does he fight? At some point, Dave responded to some chains that I had put on him, and then at some point, I gave him two blades. But those two elements were never really put together. They are like, oh, we, need, we need to hurry up and come up with something. And I think one day I was like, okay, I need, I'll need. i just go off to lunch by myself. I need to think about this. And I uh, went to Carl's Jr. I think I still have that sketch somewhere, and it's, it's like a little napkin sketch. That was the first sketch that we started to go towards. Kratos with the double blades, big thick blades, uh, swinging them around with um, his chains. As an artist, I would like to push him more. As a game artist, where we ended up, I think it works well. When I first started here, Kratos had the chain blades. The main thing, like the theory behind all of it, was to maintain the fluidity of the chain and the, the fact that there was weight at the end of them, but not, not cripple the player because of it. Not like he'd have to sit there and wind up and go all over the place. It was actually just like, uh, like a, a a performance or something, which sounds you know, but it's not. The biggest challenge, I guess, would be animating his blades in the beginning, the rig didn't really support that kind of weapon, so there was an evolution in the way we handle all that. Now the animators are a lot happier. <laughs> Actually, everything with the rig right now is pretty good. It's pretty, pretty easy to animate Kratos compared to the first game. Kratos was that sort of brutal, no holds barred, just vicious guy. What I was trying to put into it as well was it was sort of the violence, but it also had a bit of the style to it, so that you felt cool playing this guy. We wanted to keep the player interested, so we can't just do a rehash or recolor of something else. And so we struggled a lot with the powers and also the weapons. And in the first game, we had one sub-weapon, the chains and the sword. And uh, so we knew that we needed to expand upon that. I really wanted to experience that being cut down to size, that fall from grace, and have the player experience that during play, like actually have to deal with all that and then take a little bit of their own emotions of losing their powers, their frustration, and then it kind of focuses towards the antagonist of like, fuck that guy, he took my stuff. He looks more smoothly than the first game. Um, texture, 
is more uh, detailed than the first game. But uh, actually, the um, technical size is cheaper than the first game character. This is a model with texture, and we used the green color to do all the transparency. Initially, it was, it was very hard because the design always asks for a lot of things. And my initial reaction is, you know, no, we can't do that, or, or you're crazy. <laughs> The tech group and, and myself, we kind of just beat our heads against the, the desks and we figure it out and we do it, you know, and then we actually see it and go, oh, wow, you know, we can push Kratos to, to a higher level. He has full facial animation ability. We could do fine weighting. All the in-game cinematics are using this model. We're able to get closer to Kratos during actual gameplay and combat without any of the thing falling apart, which is fantastic. That's a really big thing. He really, I think, goes through a lot. At the end of this one, he's denied again his vengeance, and he finds out uh, something that the extras movie said was already so, but just bummed me out that we said that, so we're pretending that the extras movies aren't 100% there. So all the people out there who are finished the game and have gotten this and have said, oh, what the hell, the extra movie said that Kratos' mom told him that Zeus was his dad. Um, I don't care. A concept artist takes the um, descriptions from the director and just the story and we create all, design all the assets, whether it's a character, environment, a prop, um, whatever, anything visual in the game, we, you know, we draw it up, we paint it up and design what it looks like. We've got this piece here, it's Kratos uh, versus a Minotaur. This is going to be for another Game Informer. One of the nice parts about working on this image was that I got to kind of redesign the Minotaur a little bit, you know, just and had, a little, had fun with them right here. You can kind of see some of the changes going on here. One of the things that we ran into, because initially I had his head cocked a little bit further over here to his left side, but you don't see his face as well. So um, this was one of the changes that Corey asked me to do was oh, try to you know cock his head back over a little bit more so we can see his face. The palace is one of the big locations it has sort of rounder setting, and as you progressive to get to the center, you get sent to the bottom, and then there's dramatic magic release, and then you get to send to the top. I was really excited about the whole concept behind it. One thing that I was able to sell to Corey was having this two monumental statue in the front, so kind of accentuate, you know, actually step into this place worshiping like temple. The write-up they gave me was that he would create a void and uh, they're supposed to, he's supposed to take his weapon, which in this case was a boomerang, and throw it into the void and the void would appear near Kratos and, and strike him. His left arm was supposed to create the void, so I started to take half his body, or one arm would be kind of black, or, or half his body would be draped in, in cloth. As I went along, I started thinking about, how about if he threw up this void? So he would just kind of come at you and puke on the floor and create this void. Corey, he wanted it to become more like black smoke. So I started playing around with, with those themes. This was kind of what he bought off on. I was getting really close. I just had to make some minor changes on it. I really like him the way he's looking, and just at this point, they killed it. <laughs> yeah, it's still one of my favorite pieces. It was, it was a, a nice, for me, a nice exercise in, in development. What I was told was that yeah. this is where the boss fight is going to happen between the sister one and sister two and yourself. And the limitations were on this one that it's opulent just to bling it out, and it's just really grand. With a, you know, a couple back and forths, I, I came up with the, the final image. It's a lot of detail, <laughs> because 
basically they need they need this in order to build right in these areas there's like these blue rectangle things and i was thinking maybe it's just like a top of a pillar so it could be you know met with metallic or something but um ken feldman he interpreted it as blue velvet pillows <laughs> so he actually modeled like blue velvet pillows in that environment you know which is totally fine you know it could be seen as a place of worship so maybe people were to sit on them and stuff like that but so yeah seeing their take on your idea I mean, ultimately it's their idea but you know our, our concepts and seeing it in a 3d form coming alive that's where like the reward comes from all I was really given about the character Oceanus was that he resides in a lake and then comes up out of the lake and starts to wreak havoc on the gods around him this is what I came up with. Just a lot of variations of uh, the Titan body. The reaction to these was um, less than stellar. They, they thought, uh, you know, well, he looks like the other guys, you know, and uh, what are you doing? With the help of my VizDev team, we were able to kind of push it outside of the box and really make some strange, bizarre things. And my team pushed me and told me, Let's, let's make this really weird and uh, not worry about how it works. What, you know, just make it cool. This had a much more favorable reaction, but not there yet. And then he keeps evolving, keeps changing into more of a, a water creature. The elements that took me to the next step at this point was to abandon his legs. This is where we finally ended up, which was just this sort of whirlpool of water, just shooting up into the sky with his fists and just, you know, exuding power. Unfortunately, after all this work, Oceanus was cut entirely from the game. I hate water now. I really do. I just never liked it, don't swim very well, and this kind of confirms it. So I'm Stig, art director on God of War 2, and uh, we're going to take a look at some of the lost levels of the game. During the pre-production stages of God of War 2, there was a lot of time spent developing uh, different art concepts, not only on paper, but in 3D. We had a lot of uh, new environment artists start on this project. Almost more than half of the environment team is, was fresh from other companies. And, one of the things that we like to start them with is kind of building these test levels that gave them a chance to learn all the different techniques that we had created on God of War 1. But at the same time, it was good for the whole team because these guys came, you know, they were kind of the rock stars of the companies that they worked at before, and they came here with all sorts of different techniques and methods which they shared with the rest of the team. That's a big reason why you've seen such a big jump in the graphics between God of War and God of War II is because we got all these fresh ideas. The Lost Levels, um, they're not only uh, a good proving, proving ground for the, the artist to prove himself that, that he understands the tool and the technology, but it's also a pro good proving ground for the technology in general. Designing something like, like a Pegasus level is, is, is something that's very challenging for an artist. Uh, because we've never done anything like it before. Everything from just the way that we build the geometry at a, at, at a different level of detail, because it's farther away from the camera, to little things like the effects. This is kind of the canyon run stuff that we didn't get as much of it or any of it as, as, as we wanted to get. Atlantis was going to be an entire world in the game, and we uh, lost that one too unfortunately. Maybe it'll come back some other day. This is almost a complete level, pretty much. I mean, we had, we had uh, a lot of uh, everything from the visuals down to all the, the, the scripting of the events and explosions, uh, AI placement. It's very sad that it had to get cut. 
I remember when I heard about it, I was in denial for a few days. But we made our way through it, and I think and we were all very happy with the other levels. So it's nice that you got to make it onto the lost levels. Level design is a lot about coming up with the puzzles and the layout and the pacing of an area and coming up with the themes and how they integrate with the story. I worked with Corey to kind of pace it out on paper in a very, very rough form. Corey figured out what he wanted in the script and then we agreed upon different worlds and kind of the scale of the worlds, what mechanics we wanted to introduce in those worlds and then set up the layout to facilitate that on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, working with all the different level designers to make sure that everything kind of had a consistent feel to it. And then when you jump on it, it's just like a straight elevator ride down. What level design is about planning and like figuring out like, okay, if we want this, then like how are we gonna stage this and kind of sticking to your guns. But at the same time, having the fluidity to kind of like change gears when you need to, just be like, oh, well, if that totally doesn't work, throw it away, you know, and like, you know, start all over again. We basically have to look at the game from the top down, so we have to say, well, we just had a puzzle here, so let's try to like have a, a big fight because it's a little bit more visceral after you just used your brain to, you know, figure out this crazy puzzle that we threw in. So uh, we do that kind of stuff, like the just how we want the fights to go, difficulty level of the fight. How we determine how to pace the fights is very much trial and error. We'll spend days on a fight, and then we'll have a play test, and then we can throw all of what we just did out the window. You can tell just by watching them play. Camera design is basically taking the player and guiding them through the interactive experience. So the camera designer's job is to help the player understand a puzzle, uh, where to go, um, what he needs to see in order to achieve success in a video game. The camera in a game like God of War 2 is incredibly important because it basically shows the player everything that he needs to know in order to become a master at the game. When we're doing like play tests and stuff like that, we're trying to figure out what are these players trying to see. We're trying to make sure that we're, we're thinking about, well, what is the player's experience at any point? And what is the player thinking about? And so we show that. The basic viewpoint is that we're trying to stay behind Kratos and we're trying to lead the player in the proper direction. We change it up when you get into an arena and you do some combat and stuff like that. Generally, you don't ne necessarily need to be behind Kratos at that point of view. You want to see all the enemies and stuff around you. So we might go to a side view. We might go to a three-quarter top-down view. We go to different views in order to provide perspective for the player so that he can see the enemies around him a little bit better. He can have combat a little bit better. His controls feel right for the combat. But that wouldn't necessarily be the same view that we have for when they're, we're you know, following them, when we're trying to just lead them from one point to another point. We take control away from the player on the camera and we give them the shots they want and let them focus on just the gameplay itself. A limitation of our fixed camera system is that we have to show certain things at different points. So a lot of times we set up what's called a cut camera and we, like, you walk into a room there's a lever on the other side and we need to let you know that that's where you need to be. So we'll zoom in on the lever, show that, and then back out and say, okay, you know, now do what you want, but we pretty much just told you where to go. You only notice the cameras when they're bad. So uh, I think that if you don't notice the camera work, I think maybe we're doing our job right. I get the most satisfaction when I've completely designed a space, and a, or a room or a, a wad, we call them, um, and I pass that off to the artists and then the artists dump all their art in and pass it off back to me. And it's the first time I see it and it's all fully arted and I'm like, whoa, this is what I designed? This is what the artist did with that space? This is the sheet version of the level. Um, this is the start point in the spire. It's just a sandbox for us to go in and figure out exactly how the design is gonna work. This is after the uh, sheet version that I just showed you was sent off to the artists and then returned. It gets really magical when it comes back from the artists and, uh, and they've done really cool stuff with it.
I was presented with a door and a dead body, and I knew I needed to use the dead body in some way, some new and interesting way, in order to get through that door. So what I have here is the actual level that I was presented with in a wire frame, and this is the completed in-game version. Initially, the player may think that they have to put the, the, the dead body on the pressure plate and just walk over here, but since the door only opens halfway, that's not the entire puzzle. If they come over here, they'll notice there's this other pressure plate, which opens the door all the way. So if I make a run for it, kind of go through, I just don't have enough time in order to get over there. So the, the distance between here and the final door is uh, much, lo much less than the distance between here and the final door. So I should probably put that dead body on that pressure plate. And I realized that this debris that's floating by in the river was the same debris that was floating by in this other river. So it must be some kind of circuit. Um, so I put the dead body into the river just to see what would happen. And um, come over here and check in. And, oh, there's my dead body. So pick that bad boy up, put him onto the pressure plate. That opens the gate halfway. Now I'm closer to the door, so I should be able to make a break for it and run over here and exit through the door just in time. For me, I just kind of like first start off with just like imagining just like what would be like, you know, the coolest possible scenario that someone could go through on like a grapple sequence given like the parameters. And then I'll start like going down on paper and like just drawing, like sketching out the rough ideas. And then from there I go into like Maya and then I'll start actually building out the level, putting the points in and then I'll start going in there and like tweaking it and tuning it until it's done. I was thinking like, wouldn't it be cool if something else is kind of going on in the background, something else to kind of like, as you're going through this, you're like racing against this other, basically like a fuse on a bomb or something. That's kind of like the idea I was trying to go with. And something also visually, like, so when you're going through like this, you're like, shit, that's awesome, you know? Like, this is like a really cool sequence. So am I gonna make it, am I gonna make it, am I gonna make it? That's kind of like the ramping up that I wanted to feel. And then like that last moment when you're flying through and then you make it and then you're like, Phew, you know, I'm done. <laughs> I hope in the end, you know, even if you're restarting and playing through a couple times, that it's not that long and you'll be able to get through it and you'll be able to have, a, you know, an awesome experience, so. Usually in the very beginning of how we go about building the game and the creatures, me and uh, Corey and Eric and the rest of us on the combat team will sit down and we'll say, oh, you know, we need these kind of creatures. Or, you know, in, in mythology there was this. What if we took that but kind of put a spin on it so that it behaved this way? And then we'll sit down with the concept artist and we're like, oh, okay, we got this idea. Here's the things that we want to get out of the creature. And then the concept artist will come back with like 20 or 30 different ideas. And they're an amazing team. And uh, they'll be like, okay, here's a whole bunch of ideas. What, you know, what sticks? Kind of like the shotgun approach. And uh, we'll go through, we're like, oh, I wasn't thinking that, but I wasn't thinking this either, and that will really work. The simplicity of this one, but the sort of the personality in the, in the face of this one, getting across that. But I mean, I love the, the skinniness of this guy. And then from there, we'll sit down with kind of the animators and uh, the character modelers. And we'll go, okay, here's the, the personality, here's what we kind of want to get from it. And then we usually try to keep everyone in the loop so that when everyone else is working on their sort of set of creatures, they know what we're doing over here. So that way we don't have too much overlap. Most of the combat design that myself and, and the other co combat designers do is on the enemy side or the boss's side. So we come up how the enemy is going to fight Kratos and his unique attributes and his style and what he's going to do. We also come up with like the little tricks or the strategy that you're going to use against this enemy. And then from there, we come up with the animation lists and uh, we work with the animator and we go back and forth and deciding like how's this guy going to attack, how fast he's going to attack, what types of blocks he's going to use or whatever strategy it might be. From there, then we go into uh, the code and we start building the character out, get him into the level, get him running and play around with them, have them fight Kratos, trying to come up with the, the coolest way to, to kill him off. From there, it's just revisions over and over. The trick with this guy is he's covering up a little pressure plate. And what you'll need to do 
is to attack one of his tentacles until he gets stunned. And he's going to lift up his tentacle. And now you're going to use that, that last Spartan. You're going to use his body to hold that pressure plate down. And what that does is it opens up a vent, and this is where the Phoenix came from. Now you can use your, your Icarus wings to fly up in the air, but you got to be careful the, the crack can hit you down. So you want to use the Icarus wings to fly up, and then you'll get high enough where you can hit the Kraken in the head, and that's where he's actually vulnerable. One of the initial goals that we wanted was to create a, a puzzle like boss fight, so it's not just hacking away and beating up somebody and you know avoiding their attacks. It's not just simple hack and slash. Kratos is interacting with the sisters throughout the whole game. Um, you see him in statues, you see them in uh, vi little vision, little sequences. So we knew that when Kratos actually gets up to them and has to fight them, that we wanted to make it a kind of a big event. So first you'll kind of fight her on the ground. She'll kind of hang out over here and dash around and throw these little fireballs at you. From a combat point of view, this was definitely one of the most challenging parts of the game. Well, eventually she basically flies up in the air like this. So. Um, you as a player, you can't really do much from this distance. So hopefully you take note and you see these grapple points hanging around. And you know you can't stay on one for very long because she'll shoot you down. So what you basically got to do is you got to jump from each one to each and hit her in the middle, just like that. And eventually you'll get her to a little stunned state, whereas you can jump here and take her out. We've been working on this for a couple months now. We're starting to see how it's going to be and how fun it's going to be and hopefully everybody else will think it's fun too. You do not defy fate, Kratos! This is our wireless technology, the Sony wireless controller. We actually just took a controller and cut off the cord. We use this for when we're planning out uh, the button mapping in order to make the controls feel as efficient and as sort of thoughtless for the player as possible. It's natural in one sense because we're always using the L1 for a shift. Mm -hmm. So we just explain it in the shift mechanic of L1 plus R1. L1 and R2 is what Amulet of the Fates used to be. And it's a very awkward button combination for people. So now we've moved it to just R2. You turn it on, you turn it off, single button activation. And then we've taken the sub weapons, uh, which used to be just on R2. And we've turned that into an L1 plus R1 combination. The balance between the L1 and the face buttons being on opposite hands, I think really helps people to be able to use it as kind of a shift functionality. L1, it's not that bad. This is the kind of stuff where we've been toiling over this for probably about three months. We've gone through so many different control schemes to maintain the really smooth, easy controls we had from the last game, but cram in nine other features. We are already out of buttons from the last game, so it was very hard. Thank you guys. Anytime the player loses control of the game, we cut away to either what we call an in-game cinematic, which is rendered in the game engine, or you cut away to a high-res cinematic. The biggest challenge would be just trying to make it as seamless as possible, like from actual gameplay to cinematics. I provide the connection between all of the different departments that touch cinematics. It hasn't changed the end pose, right? Correct. It requires uh, constant emails, phone calls, making sure that everybody's on the same page with the script, any dialogue changes, Corey's new wishes, music, sound effects, uh, the whole nine yards. We have about 42 cinematics ranging in length between 20 seconds and three and a half minutes. So getting all of those to the level of a AAA title takes a little bit of coordination. In-game cinematics are the cinematics that are run through the actual game engine. In other words, these cinematics have to use game assets, the same characters, the same environments, the same lighting. Mostly I do uh, in-game cinematics. What I'm going to show you is a cut between combat move to the next gameplay. And right now it's a, a very raw stage where there's no special effects, no particles, and no ambient sound. The challenges of uh, this cutscene is just to convey Kratos' 
anger because he thought he already killed Colossus when actually he, he hasn't. So he's thrown into this water level. This is one of those cinematics that doesn't involve any dialogue or voiceover. It's pure cutscene. By the way, just for the record, this is how I come to work every day. Each character has these controls by which we can move them. We have a timeline, so basically what we're doing is we're posing the character on certain keyframes, and then when you play it back, you actually get the animation. It's exciting to be doing this. It's the funnest job, it's the best job, and I love it. I don't know, I, I just love doing it. The most satisfying thing is, is when I really can take all of these pieces that, that exist already, some of the ones that I've had to make uh, myself, and put them together and everything just, just clicks. This is a movie called Blade Offer 05. It's when Zeus gives you the Sword of Olympus. So what I needed to do was recreate roads. I used a lot of these pieces that had been built already, and then I had to build a few of the things myself, like these, this top stuff that you don't actually see in the game. Here's Kratos doing his thing. I had to put in all these sprites of clouds that they look strange here, but they render out correctly. Zeus opens the clouds and shows this light down, and here comes the Blade of Olympus comes down and there's these dust clouds and then uh, there's this little crack that pops up. I send all the information over to our dev kit that then builds everything. I offer you the Blade of Olympus. The high-res cinematics are cinematics that are pre-rendered. They don't have to go through the game engine at all. They can use any type of effects, any type of models, any type of lighting, whatever to make it beautiful. So the high-res cinematics may be more similar to an actual film. For the high-res cinematics, we start with a storyboard and we make sure to test all of our shots, test our ideas here on paper before doing anything in CG land. From the storyboards, we outline our moves, get our actors together, our mocap actors, go down to the facility, do the shoot, this is a photo from one of our shoots. Me and two of the actors, I handled directing the actors. Everyone was suited up. You have to start in a T-stance, and the cameras rotate around so that you can calibrate all the different markers that are on the character. Each marker is connected by a line. Think of a dot-to-dot -dot that we've all done as little kids. It kind of looks like that. After the shoot, this is what we get back, which is actually Rhea that you saw. She's holding a baby that she doesn't want to give away, but her husband Kronos has been eating all of the babies, so the only way for the baby to live is if she gives the baby away, and this is the final goodbye. This is all raw mocap data with no cleanup, no hair, and a temporary model. We send the data to an external studio. External studio starts to build the cameras, put the characters in front of the cameras, building shots and timing. And the external studio places that data into a scene with their high-res set, and their cameras. They also put it on a model that they've built high res that's gone through an approval process here. And then on top of that, they're of course building models and environments and textures and lighting. And this is the exciting part. This is what we're just starting to get back now. But when the time came for the last of her children to be eaten, she was unable to bear another such loss and devised a trick to save the baby Zeus. There are a lot of mistakes, a lot of clipping issues, it's first pass cloth, it's first pass hair, uh, all of the scenes are not rendered, but this is the first renders that we've seen. Now over the course of the next few weeks, we will spend our time giving revisions back to the external studio so that everything can be brought to final. It's going to be great once it all comes together. Rhea commanded the eagle to secret her son away. He was taken to an island well beyond the watchful eyes of Cronus.
So I'm Stig, art director on God of War II. We had uh, de developed uh, you know, only three bosses in the last game, so we came out with this one with a, with a goal of you know, trying to multiply that by five, it seemed like, at first. Icarus was uh, an interesting boss, too, because it was you know, just trying to bring this almost like uh, Aqualung, Jethro Tull uh, type uh, old disgusting man and, and uh, uh, making him just look as crazy and evil as possible, but at the same time, there's a little bit of comedy to his character, as well as the fat Medusa, I mean, obviously. Um, she's grotesque and um, she, she feels uh, very much like she's part of the same family as Sister 3, which is another one of these giant grotesque beasts. Sister 3 had to, uh, very challenging character, we had to uh, make sure that all of the, the stuff that was coming through in the concept, all the threads, the fat, the grotesque pus and pimples, and we could pull that off in 3D. And, and there was a lot of back and forth going between concept and uh, the uh, final product. And we ended up pretty much, all of the boss characters that we originally concept, we ended up creating for the game, which is, um, Pretty impressive. The different thing about Zeus is that he's our final boss. And so more care and more concern needs to go into that because it's going to be what the player remembers when they turn off the game, hoping that they finished it. Uh, so it needs to be very epic, very big, uh, big moments, not really mechanic driven, but something where you finish it and you're like, oh, I need to tell my friend this, like, oh, did you play him this way, that type of thing. Not only is he the sort of final boss, but he's also the, the kind of the main antagonist that if we do a third game, he will kind of stretch into the third. He was such an iconic figure that to ground Kratos back into Greek mythology, we wanted to make sure that when people looked at him, we, they knew right away that it was Zeus. They didn't have to guess, they didn't, you know. So it was pretty easy coming up with Zeus. I definitely didn't want to stray too far from where I think the, the literature and everybody's sort of traditional perception of where Zeus is at. Character artist gets the concept art from that department and just sculpts it in polygons and then paints on a texture and tries to make sure that it looks like what the intention was on the part of the producers and the concept artists. We're between concept art and animation in the pipeline. After we're done with it, we end up handing it off to the animators and make sure that it's all correct for what they need and you know that he bends correctly and that he moves the way he's supposed to. We wanted to make it epic in the sense that Kratos is small and Zeus is very big. Uh, but we knew we had some problems with that, so we kind of played with scale, bringing Zeus down, making Zeus back to big. When we started modeling and texturing Zeus, we didn't know that he was going to be a normal sized guy and then a giant sized guy. So that ended up adding a little bit of work to the process to make sure that he held up resolution wise. The fun part is painting the texture on and putting all the wrinkles and stuff in there. So we have two different models, a big one and a small one and trying to get the, the big one to end up in the small space where the player doesn't realize that you know they've kind of been tricked that now we're loading up the small one or now we're loading up the big one. So we had to play with various ideas of, uh, you know, we scale him up kind of off camera, but you kind of allude to it that, he, oh, he's growing. Then when we cut back, you see him, you're like, oh, you know, that happened. So here we have a different model of Zeus, the big one. And then right there, we swap to the small one. And right here, we bring the small one back in. So using a camera POV change to suggest the... Right, we have the camera kind of emulate his eyes looking down and shrinking and all that. We didn't want to give him straight melee attacks, so sort of like how the Colossus is, is like punching at Kratos. We wanted to keep him more magical. So the things that we're working on are attacks that keep his godlike appearance without getting his hands dirty. They have so much history, and that history kind of unfolds in the, the horrible things that they do to each other in this fight. So it's a sort of an interesting tying together of all these different elements and really bringing together the actual mythology of all of these gods being completely insecure because 
of the kind of cyclical nature of overthrowing uh, each other. The thing that you're going to re hopefully remember about Zeus will be uh, not only was the fight very fun, but the fight came to a finale where you're like, oh, now I see what they were doing and where they're going, and I can't wait for the next one.